don't know if you can see this, uh, and I don't know if this looks familiar to any of you, uh, but this is uh, John Podesta's tips for how to make a creamy risotto. And the reason we know this is because when the, uh, the Russian hacking operations happened during the 2016 election campaign, this was one of the things that ended up in the giant cache that was put on, uh, on WikiLeaks. Uh, so we had uh, hackers stealing information from the DNC and from Podesta, and they were leaking it at uh, critical times in the campaign. Uh, and this became kind of a punchline because people were cri critical of the media and saying, why are you talking about John Podesta's risotto recipe when you know, we should be freaking out about the Russians hacking our election system and compromising our democracy? Um, but this is important because it shows how this influence operation works, uh, and it also shows how the media works. Um, so there were 40,000 emails, and they were leaked out a uh, couple thousand at a time, day by day, uh, in the weeks leading up to the election. Um, and you know, there were important things in there. Um, there were things like uh, you know, foreign policy, comments that Hillary Clinton had made about foreign policy uh, to, in private speeches uh, to Goldman Sachs. Uh, there was information about the workings of the Clinton Foundation. So these are things that uh, voters would want to know about their presidential candidates. Um, but to get to that, there was also a whole bunch of really banal information, um, but you still needed to find it, so you had to go through all that, that banal stuff, and this is one of the things that, that came out of that. Um, and as this, all this is happening, it's taking human resources, it's taking reporters away from covering things that might be more important uh, in different aspects of the campaign. Um, and in spite of you know, the decline of the traditional media in the last few years, it still plays an important role in shaping the public conversation. Um, and I th the, uh, you know, the, the people who put together this influence operation, they obviously knew that, and policy makers know that. So um, I'm seeing more and more discussion at different events about you know, like taking a whole of society approach to, uh, to combating influence operations. Um, you know, policy makers know about the power of the media, uh, but there hasn't been much engagement with the media. Um, the, uh, the CSC, in their report that they released last year on risks to the election, uh, they identified uh, you know, the, the media, the traditional media and social media, as vulnerabilities here. Um, but you know, in, the, in the process of doing this, I've you know, reached out uh, to um, editors who are involved in, in policy decisions. Um, I've been reached out to you know, friends and colleagues who work at newspapers. I should say that I, I spent uh, about 10 years working in newsrooms from you know, very small local papers to major metro dailies. And uh, so when I'm reading some of the, the recommendations that are coming out from papers that are put together by lawyers, um, I'm thinking like this isn't realistic. I don't know if you've talked to anybody who, who works at newspapers. Um, and then the other side of this is uh, you know, people in newspapers, when I'm mentioning this to them, they're, these are just not conversations that they're having. So these are you know, two worlds who aren't really having a real dialogue with each other. And uh, I think there's a definite need for that. So um, this paper was sort of intended to be a starting point to shape you know, what, what are the contours of that dialogue and what are the kinds of things that we, we should be talking about to, to bridge those gaps. Um, so I'm going to start by just explaining a little bit about uh, you know, the digital media environment and what it is about uh, today's media environment that makes influence operations so dangerous. Um, you know, as we know, that the, the traditional media has been a really hard hit um, ever since the you know basically the, the dawn of uh, you know personal internet. Um, the, uh, there's been more places to get news as a result of that. Uh, advertising has been hit, revenues, uh, subscriptions, everything like that. And then as you get more competition, because the, the barriers to entry are lowered um, for people who want to enter this market, you've got a much broader field uh, and at much more level. Um, if you're scanning through your feeds on social media, you can see you know, a news story from the Globe and Mail and a news story from somebody who's got a, a blog, and they look basically the same. Um, there's also been a lot of research as a result of that, um, and especially coming out since 2016, uh, showing that it's, uh, people are having a harder time distinguishing between legitimate sources of news uh, and, uh, and you know, so-called fake news. Um, there's, a, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a gap in media literacy there, uh, and also is, is this part of you know, across the board uh, decline in trust of uh, traditional institutions. Um, at the same time, this is uh, you know, things are happening faster than ever. Um, you know, back when uh, cable news uh, 
and 24-hour news channels started. People talked about a 24-hour news cycle. And now it's, it's become an instantaneous news cycle. Something happens somewhere in the world. Uh, you don't have to be in front of a TV. You can look at your phone and find out about it right away. So that's uh, sort of ramped up all the pressures. You know, there's always been pressures to, uh, to break stories first or to match stories when they come out. Uh, and this is sort of you know, amped that up because you can see a rumor and then you have to track it down, see if it's real or not, um, and try and catch up with, uh, with uh, what everybody else is doing. Um, so all of this has made it easier for adversaries to, to reach the public. Um, influence operations aren't new, but back during the Cold War, uh, if you wanted to uh, influence, you know, reach out to the, the public directly, you'd have to go through somebody from a traditional news organization because they, they were the gatekeepers. There was no other way to, to reach the public. Uh, and the gatekeepers would be skeptical and they'd apply those filters. Uh, whereas now, um, you know, you can, uh, easily find Sputnik or RT uh, in your social media, or you can look it up on Google. Um, there's also, uh, we all know about the, the troll factory in St. Petersburg, where they've got more covert operations, where people are posing as, uh, as ordinary citizens. Um, and uh, by pretending to be ordinary citizens, they're polluting the information environment. Um, you know, they're, they're giving the impression that these ideas are gaining currency in the, in the public dialogue when they aren't necessarily. Uh, and then somewhere in between, we've got groups like uh, WikiLeaks, um, which are basically laundering this information um, in order to get it out into the public sphere. Um, you might not see a major news organization picking up a story from RT, uh, but if there is something else that's out there um, and they know it's out there, then it makes it easier for them to, uh, you know, it almost you know, forces their hand to, to report on it. Um, so to go into that a little bit more, um, the, uh, the definition I put up there uh, is from CBC's uh, Journalistic Standards and Practices of the Public Interest. So this is a, it, you know, not definitive, but it's a, it's a pretty good one. Um, the public interest is the, you know, the underlying driving force uh, behind journalism. Uh, it's the, you know, all, the, all the news decisions are basically weighed against this. Um, and even if the, the information was obtained in questionable or illegal means, um, it can still be published if, uh, if it's deemed that there's a strong enough public interest. We've seen this since the, the Pentagon Papers in the 1970s. Um, the second item is, is novelty. Uh, we don't often get a look at behind the scenes uh, decisions that are made on the campaign trail. Uh, so this is something that will hold the audience attention. There's an appetite for it. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, even if these discussions about campaign strategy and political, political considerations, uh, they might be perfectly innocuous, but because we don't often see them, uh, it can make them appear more suspicious than they are, and it's, uh, it can feed into public doubts about the motives of political figures. Um, Speed and competition, I spoke about that before. Um, but part of that is that uh, you know, there's, these are complicated decisions because you are weighing questions like the public interest, uh, whether there's more risks at play. And you know, in the past, you would have you know, until the deadline that night to put it together for your broadcast or for your, you to go to press. Uh, but now, because of social media, these are becoming um, you know, almost snap decisions a lot of the time. Uh, and this applies both to, uh, to covering leaks, like the WikiLeaks, uh, and also from using sources in social media. Because again, you've got, uh, and I'm sure you've all seen these sort of you know, clickbaity articles where it's like, here's what people are saying about such and such event, and they'll even you know, sometimes embed tweets in the stories. Um, it's, it's an easy way if you've got uh, somebody who's trying to catch up and to match something, to just you know, send your, your reporter, send an intern out to social media, say just, you know, present a collection of these, uh, of these tweets. Um, but there's a study by uh, journalism researchers out of Wisconsin this year uh, that found, uh, they looked at 33 major news outlets and they found that 32 of them included at least one quote from one of the, uh, one of the accounts linked to the Russian troll farm. So even if it's not, uh, it, you know, it, it might not be, uh, you know, broadly shaping their, their coverage as a whole, it's, it's still out there. These are still, and by running these stories, um, especially when a lot of them have the tone of like, you know, look what right wingers are saying about this, uh, it sort of feeds into the cycle of, uh, of distrust and uh, um, division that's, that's been happening. Um, and that's been shown to see, be one of the underlying goals of a lot of the, uh, the foreign influence campaigns. So I wanted, uh, I wanted to look at uh, 
what journalists already do uh, in this area. Because um, news organizations in Canada are generally guided by internal policies, ethics guidelines, codes of conduct uh, that reflect the norms and best practices of the journalism community. Um, and by looking at these policies, uh, it gives us a sense of what their underlying values are. Uh, and that's something that can be used if we're going to help uh, shape policy that would deal with influence operations. So I looked at uh, uh, six policy guides that were published. Those were all the ones I could find. Uh, four of them were from uh, media outlets. Uh, two of them uh, were public broadcasters. Uh, and then the, the, the last two were from uh, professional orga organizations. So one is the Canadian Association of Journalists. The second is the Radio, Television, and Digital News Association, which is the, the broadcasters group. So none of them had specific references to hacking or social media manipulation. Um, these are updated fairly frequently uh, to keep up with new developments. So um, 10 years ago, obviously, you would have had nothing about social media. And now they have sections on what to do with user-generated content. You know, can, you use a, can you use a photo that somebody posted on Twitter? Can you repost that on your own website? Uh, so they are updated frequently. Um, the latest ones, I think, uh, Tor Star, which runs the Toronto Star and a bunch of smaller newspapers. Um, I think that one was updated this year, but this is something that hasn't emerged uh, yet. Uh, but that said, there are several principles and practices that could be applied to this. Um, the first one I have up there is uh, verification. So that's saying, you know, if, if we've received documents or information, is it true? Is it accurate? Um, we know that in some of these data dumps, uh, there's a possibility that the information that's included could be manipulated. People can you know, put words on documents that weren't there before. Um, so looking into all of that, making sure it's accurate. Uh, and secondly, they all mentioned putting it into context. So you're not just sort of copy and pasting stuff that's already out there. You're, you're giving a sense of what it means and why it matters. Uh, the second concept is leaks. Uh, and there's a, there's a bit of a distinction here between leaks and hacks. The idea of hacking is that it's somebody breaks into a system and steals things that they weren't supposed to get. Uh, leaks, in a lot of cases, these are people who have access to it, uh, and they're not supposed to release it, uh, but they do. But there's more of an insider, uh, an insider sort of thing. Uh, and that, you know, everything from uh, an Edward Snowden dump where there's tons of stuff to just putting a, a document in an envelope and mailing it off to somebody. Um, so again, the idea of leaks is you're also you're looking for context. You're looking to verify as much as you can about it. Um, you're looking to suss out if there's uh, any, uh, any ulterior motives at play. And the final item is uh, anonymous sources. Um, and there's, again, there's, there's a couple of, uh, of different variations of this. Uh, one is when uh, you know, the, the reporter and the editor, they know who the source is, but they've chosen to withhold their name uh, because they're afraid of consequences for either their, their career or their safety. Uh, and the second is uh, purely anonymous. Um, and that's happening more and more. I don't know if you've seen uh, you know, websites like the Globe and Mail, they've got uh, a secure drop. So if you've got um, you know, <coughs> documents that you want to share that you think they should be made public, but you don't want it to be traced back to you, you can sort of send it to this, uh, this anonymous uh, confidential mailbox. So um, again, these are, uh, it's, it's pretty standard across the board for all three of these things. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the key principles here are determining accuracy and authenticity uh, and also providing context, including how reliable the information is uh, and if there's anything else that people should know about it. So there hasn't been uh, a lot of discussion around uh, you know, concrete alternatives for this so far. Uh, one thing that came up after the <coughs> French election is the idea of uh, introducing some kind of regulation. Um, in the case of the French election, uh, there was about 20,000 emails from Emmanuel Macron's com campaign uh, that were posted online the day before the presidential runoff vote. Uh, but because French law prevents media from quoting candidates or their supporters within 24 hours of vote, nothing really happened with them inside of France. Um, so people started saying, well, is this something we could do? Could we limit uh, you know, reporting on hacked documents during election period? Or if we know there's you know, foreign hackers involved, could we you know, just ban publishing these documents outright? Um, the idea of a ban is probably a non-starter here. Um, and uh, you know, as, as uh, Amir mentioned earlier, like we, we had uh, a sort of a, a blackout rule about reporting on, uh, on elections and social media, just it made it moot because these things were getting out there anyway. Um, so instead, uh, there's been proposals for a more normative approach, self, kind of a self-imposed professional standard. Um, 
and journalists do this in some cases. Like there have been, um, you know, when there when there's public safety at stake, uh, they will. Um, there are professional norms around not covering things uh, when it could endanger public safety. Um, there's no law against reporting on bomb threats, but most of the time you don't see any reports of bomb threats unless it becomes a, you know, they close streets and it becomes a big public event. Um, just because news organizations, they don't want to cause panic and they don't want to sort of prompt copycats. Um, another example of this is kidnapping. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, Melissa Fung, who's a CBC reporter, was kidnapped in Afghanistan. And uh, all the, basically all the major Western news organizations made an agreement not to even report <coughs> the fact that she was kidnapped until after she was, uh, she was recovered because they didn't want to jeopardize the negotiations and they didn't want to jeopardize her safety. So there is a precedent for this. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea when these things happen for being public safety and the public interest, I mean, there's, a, there's a clear parallel there to be made that if there's a threat to democracy, that becomes an issue of public interest. So it's, it's defining public interest more broadly instead of just being the interest in knowing a fact of information. Are you doing you know, more harm by reporting it or by not reporting it? Um, again, that, that's uh, not, as, uh, not as straightforward because we are in a digital news environment. So there is social media. Um, if you, uh, you know, enforce this kind of thing for Canadian uh, news outlets, there's nothing to stop a blogger from in the United States from reposting uh, stolen documents, post posting them online. They're still going to be available here. Um, and that's sort of the counter argument to this is, well, if this information is going to get it out there anyway, we should at least be the ones providing context, because if we're not, they're just going to see it and they can, you know, put whatever spin on it. Um, so we at least have sort of this reputation for, for integrity. We have this commitment to, uh, to providing more information. Um, the third item I've got there, uh, transparency practices. Um, and again, this is, this is something that is already being done um, in, uh, you know, within newspapers. So rather than uh, you know, making a binary decision on whether to publish something or not, um, it's sort of strengthening those practices around saying, well, this is, you know, this is what it is. This is where it came from. Here's what we suspect, you know, might be the source of this. Um, and, uh, you know, in cases where you're only getting leaks from one side of the campaign, as happened in 2016, doing a little bit more balance, talking about that instead of just um, reproducing what's out there. Uh, and the final item is uh, government cooperation. Um, and we've seen this in, in Sweden. Um, they have something called a civil, con civil contingencies agency that regularly meets with media organizations as part of their emergency preparedness measures. So ahead of their election this year, uh, they began meeting more regularly with this group to discuss uh, how media outlets could counter disinformation and how they could resist influence attempts. Um, the problem is that some of the, uh, the news outlets became skeptical of this uh, and they limited their participation uh, because they were afraid it could uh, compromise their independence uh, or more importantly they were afraid it could uh, compromise their appearance of independence if people thought that they were collaborating with the government. So um, you know, th this is an option because again I think a lot of, uh, you know, there's if the media, if the government, and if the intelligence agencies have um, information about what's happening, uh, it's uh, it, it will help their cause uh, if the media knows about it. If they can help, uh, you know, give people more information about what's going on, so they can, they can be prepared, they can be on the on the watch for for um, you know the false rumors and false information and things that are spreading online. Um, but it, it, if it does, it needs to be done in a way that uh, it maintains uh, that appearance of, uh, of independence. Um, and finally, I didn't put this up there, but I should have uh, media literacy and uh, digital media literacy programs. Um, and this is something that you know, the, the government can do. Uh, they can bring in uh, media organizations, but you don't need to. Um, and you know, because of the changes in, in the media environment, uh, it, this is something that can be done, and there are efforts being done right now, um, you know, very preliminary efforts to try and do this in schools. Um, but a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, if you, if you run these programs in schools, you're not going to reach people like, you know, my 80-year-old grandfather who, or my 80-year-old uh, great uncle who posts things that are uh, just really make you think. <laughs> um, and uh, so there, there's, uh, there's a lot more work to be there, done there as well. 
Um, so just to wrap up, um, I, I think you know, I wish I had Chris's uh, more research needed stamp because I feel like I could use that for this uh, this entire uh, this entire area. Uh, there's not a, not a lot of research, especially not a lot of Canadian research, and uh, not nearly enough dialogue. Um, you know, the media is an important part of society. So if we're talking about whole of society approaches to to counter. Uh, influence operations, um, they should, uh, they really need to be brought on board. Um, and the good thing is now there is awareness of this issue, um, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, so this uh, hopefully raises an opportunity to, to move ahead with this.